Hi. Hi, I missed you. I missed you too. I managed. <laughs> I, had a, I had an opening theme. And since I had like literally no idea what I was going to do, the theme for the day was flexibility <laughs> <laughs> and improvisation. Yes. One of the practitioners gave us the closing quote. And I don't actually remember what it was, but it was really good. I love it. It's like a little village that we have. So everybody like stepped up and participated. And we got to answer questions and it was really fun. Did you have fun in Canada? It was very busy as all the trips up to Canada are. We were on the West Coast for a good portion and then we were on the East Coast for the other portion and oh my. just oh. got back yesterday and my cherry tree is exploding. With cherries or with blossoms? With cherries. Oh my gosh. I wish I could send them to you because they they are like the size of plums and they're deep red and they're so sweet and it's the biggest harvest we've ever had. No way. That's amazing. It's just the little things when you come home and then there's a cherry tree that's literally bending with cherries. Oh, that is outstanding. How do I missed everybody. I missed doing this. Oh, turn the volume down, Kevin. On something. Oh. It's loud. It's a Kevin. Oh. Okay. Usually all Kevin has to do is stand next to it and it behaves itself. Ooh, I like that. And no leaf, I didn't come visit you in North Van. Calgary was as close as I got, but that's okay. Um, I'll let you know the next time I'm up there. And I got an email from somebody that listened to the podcast. I'm not sure when it was, because I don't remember saying what she said I said. And it was she said, I said, don't be so Canadian. And I would never say that to you. I can imagine saying, you are so Canadian. I think I remember that, but it was like when I was treating you and you thought my hands were polite or something like that. And I think, was that the reference? It, was on, a, it was on the podcast. Oh. I but know. I love that you're Canadian. I, like, well, it's, I'm officially dual. I have my American citizenship now. So I'm like, I get the two passports. Yes. Is that my hearing aids? Maybe I need to turn them down. That's going to be so loud. Huh? Is it loud? Yeah. Okay. It's not just me. Okay. Talk, Kim. <laughs> well, you sounded loud to me. It still okay. sounds. I don't know how to. Maybe we turn this down. Okay. Oh, see? Kevin can always fix it. Yeah. Is that better? So, what did you talk about? I want I to talk about flexibility. No, you're too quiet. I don't actually remember. It was all Q&A. Yes. So it was random stuff. Yes. There we go. And I don't actually remember. Okay. But I have answered a lot of questions. We answered a lot of questions, which right. is it was like a master class without. Yeah. Anyone. Fantastic. But I have to tell you, I have patient stories from this week. Okay. I do too. So there is a condition that is genetic. It's called SPG7. Okay. And a patient came from out of state. Can't remember where she came from. But it's the corticospinal tract. So the motor pathway. And I think of the corticospinal tract in the spinal cord. You look up on your phone and yeah, the corticospinal tract goes up your spinal cord, but then it goes medulla to pons to sensory motor cortex. And the symptoms are motor weakness, spasticity, foot drop. She, her tongue was numb. Her voice was fuzzy and she didn't have a strong bladder contraction. Like, so when she went to urinate, it just dribbled out. She couldn't activate the muscles in her bladder. So you look it up and you go, okay, we have a frequency to repair DNA. And the good news was that her genetics were heterozygous. She had one copy of the gene that was present and one that was absent. And she was fine until she was 35. And now she's 
41 or something, 40 something. So she's been like this for five, six years. And anyway, so well, we had one copy of the gene. She was fine until she was 35. So what happened when she was 35? A bunch of stress. So we ran concussion in Vegas. And then if you have one working copy, you can drive it to produce GABA and acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is for the pons and the mouth and the upper nerves. Right. And then GABA is to reduce the spasticity. So between the two of them, anyway, I looked it up and went, can't hurt, might help. Hooked her up from neck to feet with sensory motor cortex, pons, cerebellum, medulla, spinal cord, and ner nerve all with increased secretions. The first day I didn't do the nerve and the foot drop didn't improve. Second day, I did the nerve. She urinated forcefully. Her tongue was never numb. The tremor in her hand went away and her gait settled down. Foot drop got better and I took her into the gym and we ran 81 and 84 increased secretions in the cerebellum to coordinate any, everything. Yeah, nice that you're not spastic anymore, but your brain has no idea how to operate these muscles to make them work. So she got so stoned when I did increased secretions in the cerebellum. It was hard for her to walk, not because she wasn't coordinated, but because so we're walking down the hallway and there's that sign in the clinic, be realistic, expect a miracle, but be patient. The impossible takes longer than the difficult. What we did in that 60 minutes was impossible. It's, she started sleeping eight hours a night instead of waking up with spasticity every two or three. It was, I, ha, okay, fine. And that was one treatment? She was there for four, four or five days. Okay. Five days. Yeah. And we had a weekend. So I last treatment was on a Friday and every day got better. It held for longer. And then she took a custom care home with her on Monday. And because her legs are working better, but her trunk is still having trouble and she's not moving her arms. So it took me until Monday, duh, to tell her we I programmed a combo that she can run at night and then programmed each frequency separately. I said, put 81 and 84 increased secretions in the cerebellum on your neck and put wraps on your ankles and crawl. You won't fall. And you have to get your arms and your legs coordinated. Yeah. It was, and then this week, that was last week. This week, there was a girl that came in, there is a girl that came in with complex regional pain syndrome. So basically neuropathic pain in the superior laryngeal nerve, okay. which operates the vocal cords. So she hasn't been able to speak without intense nerve pain for a year and a half. And it was mold, then COVID, then Lyme over a three or four year period. So it's okay. It, CRPS means the vagus nerve is disconnected. So we ran mold in the vagus virus in the vagus, Lyme in the heart, took her heart rate from 108 to 81. And then Lyme in the vagus, increased secretions in the vagus, 
And at the end of 60 minutes, she was able to talk without pain for the first time in a year and a half. So that was my week so far. And it's Wednesday. Okay. Okay, I just have a bunch of athletes that PR'd everything that they've ever touched. So nothing compared to these sort of <laughs> Whoever heard of, I asked her, what's your official diagnosis? Because she's going to submit to get the custom care paid for. And, I, and she said, they diagnosed me with CRPS in the superior laryngeal nerve. And I said, superior laryngeal nerve is the vagus. And she went, oh. The ENT didn't know that. And I went, oh, okay. So I showed them the vagus nerve webinar. Yeah. And we went through, she and her mom both had central sensitization from a very difficult childhood, pregnancy, childhood. And it's okay. There you go. Is that cool? It's funny that it's not because... Vegas was something I wanted to touch on a little bit because I have been doing like supine cervical. I, with my athletes, they all have disastrous anterior necks. I don't know why people have such issues treating the anterior C-spine or they think it's not as important as treating the posterior C-spine. I don't understand. They have but, to go together. But every time I work on somebody's necks, people are just like, oh, nobody's really gotten in there ever. I'm like, okay, why? How did you get through so many years of being a professional athlete without people seeing that this is a very important structure? I don't know. Without FSM, if all you have is being able to mash on it, you don't want to mash on the carotid, the jugular, the vagus, the a little not. True. Yeah, on it. True. I don't know. It it does. And yes, it FSM makes it so much easier to just melt everything and to mobilize. And it is, it's hard for a patient to have people touch the front of their neck. It can set off a whole cascade of anxiety. And when they're stoned, it makes things a lot easier to just move your trachea over and get into that longus coli or wherever you need to go. But I was working on a patient who it nothing was letting go. And Part of my quote that I'm going to start, I'm going to tell you now instead of after, because it's going to tie in together. My, the quote of the day today is, you cannot shake hands with a clenched fist. Oh, amen. Absolutely. So multifactorial quote here, but that was, I had thought of that quote while I was working on this neck and it's no, don't lis listen to your own teaching advice. It doesn't mean press harder or mobilize stronger. You're missing it. And what let it go was 94-109 trauma with the vagus nerve. Wow. Okay. And how it jumped out at me, I have no idea, but I got a little bit with scarring in the vagus. I knew the vagus was traumatized from the motor vehicle accident, from the fall off the horse, from the hit, from the, there was multiple things, Yeah. but it's <clears throat> that voice that tells you you're on the right B channel but think about it differently. And we use 94. I've been really going back to those basics a lot and get yeah, that vagus nerve. Like what happened before the vagus got scarred? Because if 13, and I think this works for lots of tissues, if you're getting some results with 13, so scarring in a tissue, you have to think it didn't get scarred from outer space. What happened before it got scarred? There was some sort of trauma there. And in two patients this week, the problem was vagal. Yeah. But the place where the vagus was stuck wasn't here behind the ear. It was here where it crossed yes. under. And both of them had root canals. Oh. And so the place where the vagus was stuck was the lymph node. So the lymphatics that follow the vagus down the neck, mm. they ended up running in infection in and scarring in the lymph node. And then we could get the vagus unstuck. So what is the vagus stuck to? And it, it requires that you 
think in three dimensions and almost four dimensions because you have to add time. So it's not just anatomical three dimensions, it's also time. Yes. What happened? Nothing. And then the key was which order. And this particular patient had a bizarre root canal story and a 3D cone beam that showed upper cavitations. So it's one of the few people I know that started with Neil Nathan, Mary Ellen Chalmers, Dietrich Klinghart, and then got to me. Wow. Yeah. So she's like already studied cast right there. She, yeah. <laughs> and that was the problem. The vagus got stuck before it entered the vocal cord. And every time she turned her head or swallowed, because of the adhesions, she created a nerve traction injury in the vagus and it eventually disconnected, but it had all these precursors. So you're exactly right. It's like the frequencies let you think in four four dimensions, three physical dimensions, but also time. The auto accident, the hockey stick, the horse. Yeah, multifactorial. And then I had somebody ask the question, why don't you just start with trauma to begin with? And it's, yeah, I get that, but it's not always indicated. And for me, I'm always thinking, how am I going to get this patient out of pain? So I'm always thinking about calming the nervous system down first, because it doesn't matter where you think you need to go to. And you have those moments where you just start seeing numbers flash before your eyes, because you know, you have to hit all these things. But I always try to like take a breath and slow down and think, but I need to get this patient out of pain first. And then I can go back and make it permanent and make all those changes that I need to. So we know that nothing is going to happen if our nervous system perceives a nerve is going to to traction or tear. So when there's structures around that nerve, fascia, muscle, adipose that are adhered and jumbled up, you have to address that first, regardless if trauma is what caused it, make a dent in it. I always to think in my head, make a dent, get the smush, get them sleepy, get some movement going, And then you can go back and then, okay, we're going to need to do this because. Well, body's not going to let you. Like right there anyways. The body's not going to let you do anything as long as whatever you're touching is painful. The muscles will splint up. They'll bounce you off. For me, the anterior cervicals, especially the lower cervicals, it's always 124 and 710. Right. In previous years, it would have been inflammation in the disc annulus and then two seminars in a row the instructor said i've been using 124 torn and broken in the disc annulus and that works better than 40 so during the practicum we tried it and they were right so i'll set one machine up if the anterior cervicals are really tight i'll set one machine up with 124 and 710 And I have single frequency combinations programmed into a custom care. Find that one, let that run for 60 minutes while I'm working on this facets and the muscles. It's like what's making the anterior cervicals tight. And that splinting mechanism that that echoes in the body, regardless if it's a disc, a nerve, degeneration and cartilage, like our musculoskeletal system is so smart and works at this amazingly subconscious level of always trying to think they have our best. It's like a helicopter mom, right? We think we have our best interest for our kids and we're going in trying to pad the room for them and it's just, hey, stop. So that's how I see sometimes all this splinting, this unnecessary splinting that's going on. And yes, treating like 13 and 77, scarring the connective tissue, you're gonna get some smush. Yes, put your little award behind you. Well, I keep seeing your award behind you and it's, wait, this is out of sight. I want to put it right <laughs> See it. It's the only time I look at it. Right. And no, so. The, so, the you know, is unnecessary geez. splinting. The cerebellum thinks it's necessary or it wouldn't be there. For sure. 
And a lot of times it can work like with the torn labrum and the shoulder, that splinting is what takes the pain away. Otherwise that labor was going to continue to tear. It's going to continue to get hurt. But again, going back to torn and broken in the annulus. So 124, 710, it is a magical frequency combination. It can be a religious experience when that's indicated. And let's face it, if we image the majority of people over the age of 35, we're going to see some tearing in the annulus. So I think that's a great one to start with because most of us have that at some level. Yeah. And then sometimes, so I had a patient last week or the week before, she has lumbar stenosis and she has a bunch of disc bulges and, and leg pain. And she said, the side of my leg hurts. And she said, what about the herniated discs? And I said, and I looked at the MRI and said, yes, you have bulging discs, but bend forward. Does that make it better or worse? That makes it better. Okay, then it's not the disc. What about the herniated disc? The orthopedic surgeon says it's the disc. And I said, the stenosis is coming from the joints in the back. And that pain you have down the side of your leg if you look at this pattern on the wall, it's coming from the joints in the back. So the, the differential diagnosis, is it what's the pain generator? Is it muscle, disc, nerve, facet, joint? And then why is it hurting? Is it because you were a football player or because? When did it get hurt? Is it still hurting? What can you do besides FSM? It's really fun being us. Every, every, what, what were those tests when you're trying to figure out what you wanted to do with your life? Not aptitude tests, but like aptitude tests. And it yeah. would help figure out what profession to go into. 100% of the time, every time I do it, even to this day, detective shows up as like my, and I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Every day I'm a detective. Yeah. I, I guess I, I always have that question of why is this like that? And I think if you can really just start as a practitioner with that question, why is that patient presenting with this pattern? And you had said it a couple of podcasts ago about pattern recognition. You're really good at pattern recognition. And yes, doing something for as long as you have, you, you get that. But for new practitioners, I would say if you're getting frustrated and we all do with what we are, if you can boil it down to that pattern recognition, asking the question, why is it like that? And even patients that are listening, ask your body, ask yourself, like, how did it get like this? What else was happening so that you can paint a better picture for the practitioner that's treating you? Because there's always that sub story that's going on that we tend to forget about because we're not used to putting all these things together, I think. And then the other helpful question is what makes it better? What makes it worse? Yes. And that's, that's the key. Yeah. Because it's constant. Oh, constant when all day. No, it's better when I get up in the morning. Okay. What makes it worse? Like hip pain soon as I walk on it. Okay, let's do an x-ray of your hip. And there's no hip joint left. So then I probably had, I don't know, double did almost double digits of patients who came in and said, I want to avoid a hip replacement. And you look at the x-rays and go, no, I can fix it so you can sleep at night. But these x-rays say that you're about three to five years past the point where we could avoid it. I can't put bone back or cartilage back that's not there. Yeah. <clears throat> However, you hunt around, talk to your GP, your friends that are nurses, find interview for orthopedic surgeons who do only hips and pick the guy that you like that will talk to you that will communicate with that you trust yeah so you're comfortable going into it and i have a custom care that you can buy so you your recovery is six weeks instead of three months yeah it's easy 
yeah. knees, not so much, yeah. but hips, yeah. So. Funny that you mentioned hips. It's one on my list today to talk about because somebody had who had taken the course had asked me about treating <clears throat> people with tight hip flexors. And yeah, like my initial like reaction is not never a good one because I'm like, we need to get away from just hammering on people's hip flexors because they're never tight for no reason at all. It's never the psoas. It's always the ureter. Well, there's that. I will say biomechanically, we are living in an era in an environment where people have chronically shortened hip flexors. And we also right. have chronically short, like just our anterior chain is chronically shortened because we're yeah. sitting right than we ever used to. But that doesn't mean someone's hip flexors are tight. Yeah, exactly. They're always short. That's a good point. So, and that's what I want to talk about. Like we, we talk about, or you talk about the story all the time with, I believe it was a marathon runner that came to see you and said that she had a weak glute. And you're like, you run 30 miles a week. Like your glutes aren't weak. Portions of it could be inhibited. Well, one glute is not weak. Your right glute is not going to be weak for no reason. So there's that. And I'll talk about the whole thing in a minute, but let's get to a couple questions because I see they're starting to pile up and I want to- Yeah, I just pulled them up. Okay. Um, I think Leaf had the first question about something about fat for diabetes. Hi, Leaf. Hi, Leaf. Um, Adipose tissue. Okay. So I just did a preventing type 2 diabetes summit thing. And the, the challenge with- insulin resistance is the adipose becomes resistant to the ability of adipose to store the excess calories from sugar. So insulin makes it possible. I think that's how it works for sugar to get stored as fat. And when the fat becomes resistant to the signals from insulin that says, hey, sugar coming in, turn it into fat. And the fat says, no, sorry, I don't understand you. Norman, Norton Fishman developed a protocol for insulin resistance in 2003 or four. And he did it by muscle testing or scanning for it. But the literature has actually confirmed what he found. It's inflammation, trauma. There's an emotional component. There's an infectious component. So he picked 230 and 430. And since then, I've updated the insulin resistance protocol to include 160, just malignant virus, and 61. And then toxicity in the adipose, but inflammation in the adipose. And everybody I ran it on when I came home from Norton's, Dr. Fishman's place, lost their appetite, lost their appetite for sweets, had their waist size reduced from half an inch to an inch in a week, and they all got constipated. So the first time I taught it, I warned people they would get constipated. And one of the nature paths muscle tested his staff and said, the toxicity goes from the adipose to the parasympathetics. So that fixed the insulin resistance protocol so it didn't make con people constipated. But then Rob DiMartino gave a lecture about leptin resistance. And it's too complicated to do without slides. <clears throat> but leptin controls insulin, leptin and adipose go together. And leptin is the vagus is involved, stress is involved, melatonin is involved in leptin sensitivity. So leptin resistance, insulin resistance, leptin sensitivity, insulin sensitivity, those go together. You have to watch that section of the advanced, but 
that's the key. So somebody that's 50 pounds overweight, the problem is not so much the weight, although that's a problem for joints and blood pressure and all that. But the adipose is inflammatory. It's not just a storage site. It's actually immunologically active. And that inflammation and the constant need for insulin basically exhausts the pancreatic islets and you get type 2 diabetes because you're overweight, but not just because you're overweight. It's because the pancreas has to keep producing more and more insulin to drive the excess calories into fat. It's complicated. It makes my brain hurt. And the, the th yeah, it's even worse when you read the slides because it makes sense when I'm looking at the slides. And then, but the key, the thing that we have as an advantage over anybody else that's treating this is that we can treat the vagus. Yeah. So the vagus nerve tells the liver to put out less sugar. And the vagus nerve tells the brain, don't stress, dude. It's fine. We're all good down here. So you put those three pieces together and it gives us an advantage. Yeah. And I yeah. love Leif Erickson says, Harry Van Gelder quote, always ask why. Right. That's where I got it. Right. I yeah. lived with George for 31 years. That means I lived with Harry Van Gelder for 31 years <laughs> in my head. <clears throat> yes. Why? It's like when my kids were toddlers and it's just, we're going to go now, but why? Is it time to go? But why? Because yeah. yeah, put your shoes on. Why? <laughs> so I've, I'm a middle aged toddler now, asking my patients. Okay, but why? Just listen to your inner child, right? Yes. All right, um, Derek. Oh, Derek, I've been trying to email you, but Derek says get the emotional aspect out of the way first. That's a big component, and that's again a reason to have multiple machines, right? Like to be able to address the emotional side of everything while dealing with the scarring or the inflammation or the torn and broken and the bleeding is huge. And when you have a patient where they have multiple things going on, I have one custom care that's concussion in Vegas that runs, that's 48, 47 minutes and I have 60 minute appointment slots. Yeah. And then TH. Yeah. Nobody should have this many things that happened to them in the last 18 years. This is not normal. Yeah. So TH also includes the frequencies for the emotional component. Yeah. So all of the emotions in order. Yeah. Terror, overconcern, anger, resentment, then grief. Yeah. And then 970 and 9, life has lost its sweetness. And then restoring joy, that kind of stuff. Well done, Derek. Thank you. Yes. And leaf 124 and 710, it works for lumbar vertebra. But the thing that everybody needs to understand and the challenge we have with some patients is they want, they are used to passive treatment. I go to my chiropractor twice a week. I get a massage twice a month uh-huh and what are we doing for exercise it hurts too much when i exercise then we're doing the wrong kind of exercise so right. you there's no way for f for passive treatment by itself to fix you i can get you out of pain and these are the exercises you're going to do to repair the disc right or the facets right or the bursa or the whatever. Like how many patients did I have this conversation with in the past two weeks about getting an epidural or a cortisone shot and thinking they're done now with me? And I'm like, <laughs> okay. I'm like, no, I'm so happy you're out of pain. And that injection got you out of pain like that. But now the work gets to start because now that you're out of pain is your opportunity. Now's the window to go in there and get things firing, get things structurally where they're supposed to be. Stable circulation, muscle, proper muscle contraction 
and I'm stepping into your sandbox here, but proper muscle function brings circulation. Yes. It's like I've had blown discs in my low back since 1996, seven. Yeah. And the disc was thin and dark on an MRI. And I ran microcurrent and I did the exercises from new heights, contracting the multifidi and the rotatories. And five years later, when I did something else traumatic, I tore my SI joint, but they did another lumbar MRI. And that same thin, dark disc was now thick and white and fluffy because I did my exercises for six months and corrected my posture. Yeah, there's That's another good quote. The first thing to do when you want to bail out a boat is to stop shooting holes in the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I laugh because it's common sense to so many of us, but not to people that are in it and have never been told another way to do things. Sure. Uh, I had a patient this week, new patient who you're going through, you're asking why about the pain? When does the pain get worse? When is it better? And he was like, oh, it's, it's just, it's so bad when I wake up in the morning. I'm like, okay. And he's like, why are you smiling? I'm like, because your next thing is going to say, but as I get moving, it improves. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, fantastic. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, movement makes the pain go away. That's great. This is like easy. And then the next question is, what position do you sleep in? You sleep on my stomach. That's exactly how it went, right? And people who are stomach sleepers, they end up looking, I always say it's like Spider-Man crawling up the wall. Like everything is rotated and twisted. And then he's, but my aura ring tells me like I barely move. And I'm like, that's even worse because you're stuck in that position for eight hours. So everything is torqued, rotated, stacked compressed, compressed, tractioned. So it's all about reframing it, I think, right? So asking those questions. Reframing is a good word. Hey, Derek needs to know if you're going to stay at his place. Yes, I've been trying to email him about that. So Derek, if you can call me or email me, we can discuss it off the show. <laughs> Nina mm. asks, what do you suggest for a client with a benign cyst on her sternum and ribs? Number one, in my experience, 59 never works. I've never had it work on a cyst. Okay. It seems to, at least I have the hope, that it will reduce the tendency to make cysts in response to inflammation and toxicity. Okay. I've a patient with a four centimeter breast cyst, and we went to the imaging center they did an ultrasound of her breast identified the size of the cyst then we went back in the dressing room and I treated it and with my hands on it frequencies for cystic condition did zero frequency for inflammation reduced it the frequency for toxicity took it down by 25 percent in I don't know 20 minutes so it was 30 minutes between one ultrasound and the next one. And the volume of the cyst was reduced by 25%. Wow. Her OBGYN still went in five days later and drained the cyst, but it never reformed. So it's the cyst is coming from some place. So treating the cyst, I don't think Nina is the thing. And if it's on the sternum, Derek, you're right, it's 783, but the cyst forms in the superficial tissue between the bone and the skin, which is fascia. Yeah. And if you look at the lymphatics, maybe, that mm -hmm. go down the sternum. And then when did it start? Yeah. And the other thing is, if you can't change it, have a dermatologist drain it and treat it for wound healing. FSM is not the solution to everything. So have somebody take it out and then treat it for wound healing and you'll be better in two or three days. It's nothing burger. 
there, there's no general anesthesia. It's a local. Yeah. It's either one or two stitches or just a strip, depending on the size of it. And we have, and you have to find out what's in it. Yeah. Is it truly benign? Who knows it's benign unless they biopsied it? Sure. How do you know it's benign? Because somebody said it was benign. Great. How do they know? I muscle tested for it. Don't get me started. So there's yeah. that. So way to go, Nina. Great. I'm asking about FSMers in Great Britain. I'm sure on the website. Eva and her team are in London, northeast part of London. I can see her face. So I and she's in Bath. One of our instructors, blonde hair, brown face, I can see her, so I can't remember her name. But we have quite a few practitioners now in, in the UK because we've been there for up a couple of years. And yeah, and in Ireland as well. Oh, Bird, Brid Hannon, she took the FSM course, but she's really a fan of the Healy and the Mag Healy. She took the FSM course, I think the first time we went to London, when we went to the osteopathic college, because the lady who's wonderful, Angela Stevenson, thank you, is not DO. And so the first course we did was at the osteopathic college near London Bridge. Oh, and Debbie so, Benjamin says that she's yeah. in Sussex. She does. Yeah, work. East Sussex. Yeah, she goes. Oh, Debbie. Hi, Beth, Debbie. And then Brit is adorable. She's fun. Uh, you just love the disbelief in your client's face when they can move something they haven't moved in months or years. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. There's nothing that quite like will ever replicate that when somebody, oh, you're reading something interesting. Hang on. Yeah. And the, the lady with the CRPS, like she hasn't been able to talk in a year and a half. And at the end of the hour, the pain's gone. And I said, okay, try talking. And she was afraid. And I said, try it. She was able to talk. And then it stayed. She was able to talk. She was able to eat crackers and swallow wow. for the first time in three years. She's lost. She's at least 20 to 30 pounds of underweight because yeah. she hasn't been able to eat without pain. It's pretty cool. Anemia. Oh, Where's that? Justin's for anemia. Okay. Hi, Margaret. That's all you. I'd find a different hematologist. That something's not making sense. Iron supplements do nothing. So lack of iron is not the problem. What is the problem? That's just, yeah. The salute. Hematologists and endocrinologists, I'm not entirely sure what the problem is in that arena, but a patient that has an empty cella and the endocrinologist won't test signaling hormones. Why? Because the signaling hormones come from the pituitary and the place where the pituitary should be is missing on this place, patient. So why would you not test signaling hormones? I don't get it. I don't understand. It's not my scope. And yeah, so there's got to be somebody out there. I'm wow. glad you agree, Margaret. And I don't know what the solution is. If iron doesn't fix them, then iron's not the problem. Two blood transfusions? And she's not bleeding. 18 and 62. I, okay, I give up. Yeah. <laughs> Onward. Onward. So circling back to my hip flexor people, because oh, I, yeah. I do get this, these questions like sent to me quite often. I want to give, I want to simplify something as best as I can for people. So everybody's going to come on a little journey, a little story with me. So our anterior chain, like I said, so everything on the front of us, patients who are listening, I want you to pay attention to this also. We're chronically shortened because we sit too much, we drive too much, we, we don't take breaks. 
So the muscles on the front of us tend to just, you're never going to have like a foldy muscle. Like our body will adaptively shorten to take up the slack. So like the hip flexors get affected by far the most because they're always scrunched up because we're sitting in these chairs. And then the front of us, like our abdomen and our pecs and everything shorten as well because we're typing and cooking and driving and we're close together. So when that happens, the people who are listening on the podcast can't see my fingers, but imagine like my fingers are interlaced and I'm pushing my fingers together. So when our bodies are adaptively shortened, our muscle fibers like glue together and we're going to go back to the sliding filament mechanism or actin and myosin, those heads can't contract properly because they're overlapped. So that's what we call not, there's a stretch weakness and then there's a shortened, a, a tight weakness. So just because something is tight, like the hip flexors, or they're adaptively shortened, they will test weak because the actin and myosin, those heads that have to contract the fiber, they can't optimally grab each other because they're, they're all shortened up in this bundle. So when we're talking about frequencies to help with that, I found that 13, obviously so scarring because... 13 is that magical frequency that helps unleash or helps relax or vibrate apart those bonds that hold the fibers together. So when those fibers now have the permission to not be glued together, they're able to create space. And then they're, it's like taking a breath, right? Oh, I don't have to be stuck to my neighbor anymore. And then when they're in that optimal position, then they're able to contract properly. So 13 is and 51 three and 97, like all those like scarring fibrotic type of frequencies are going to work really well. But then you have to follow that up with increasing the secretions to the area, because if those fibers, if those sarcomeres have been like bound together, they need to have increased secretions so that they can move apart optimally again. And the other thing is that if you've been stuck this way, flexed, the muscles in the back are inhibited because the muscles in the front are tight. Exactly. After you loosen up the front, the next step before they walk out of the office has to be to get them to sit up. Yes. And straight, right. keep their chin in neutral and take their shoulder blades and activate. If the only thing they ever do is activate the lower trapezius. Yes. That seems to let the whole posterior chain know, oh, you want me vertical. Oh, and now that the front isn't tight, I can contract. What a concept. What a concept. So to piggyback on what you were just saying, the opposite of that tight weakness is what we call a stretch weakness. So Mm -hmm. the erector spinae group in the back is the rhomboids. Like I said, the biggest thing that makes my head spin around in a circle is when someone says that a patient has tight rhomboids. Nobody ever on the planet in 24 years has had tight rhomboids. They have slips of the rhomboids that are have contractures and trigger points in them, 100%. But a rhomboid isn't ever tight because we're never in retraction. And the thing that's tight in between the shoulder blades is the longissimus thoracis and cervicis that are right under the rhomboids. And it's easy to get suckered into thinking it's the rhomboids, but when you feel it, the thing that's tight doesn't run laterally or at an angle. It yes. runs vertically. Yes. It's beneath the rhomboids because I don't know what your cadaver looked like, but my cadaver was a well developed adult male. And his rhomboids were uh, this uh, thickness of two pieces of typing paper. Absolutely. They're insignificant. I don't want to say insignificant, but they are not these massive muscles that people give them so much credit for. Exactly. Like I get it. You, you point on it and some massage therapist or some trainer said, oh, those are your rhomboids because the fibers look like they were running like this, but that's not always the case. That's never the case. Okay. So going back to those muscles that are chronically elongated. So that's that stretch weakness. So the back muscles, cause we're hunched over the rhomboids because they are in this, we're in this protracted state, they are going to respond very well to 124 because they're, you've got these micro tears in them because they're elongated. So these fibers are pulled and stretched apart. That's torn and broken. 
So running 120 for first can be really helpful because you're you're that's the cause of the pain is because they're torn, they're elongated. And the muscle itself may not be why they're painful or weak, but if you look at the anatomy, open up never, and they connect to the scapula or the spine with a layer of line of connective tissue. So it's 124 and 77, the connective tissue, 124 in the fascia. Yeah. In order for a muscle to be strong and functional, it can't go from contract, contract. It has to relax and then contract. Exactly. It can't go from ex eccentric, stretched, it, if it can't. So they ha it has to move That's in right. both directions. That's right. And to your point, again, it's the agonist antagonist relationship. So if our primary mover, our agonist is our core, the antagonist mm -hmm. is our back, both have to be on board with that this movement is going to happen. It has to be perceived as being safe and functional for both sides of it to happen. So we're not going to get into this great extended posture if we have adhesions in our abdomen that's perceiving extension as dangerous. We have to give permission for these muscles to elongate, for those muscles to contract. It's like a yin and yang. And the advantage that we have with FSM is the ability to treat adhesions in the nerve and re-educating the cerebellum the thalamus, because if it has been chronically painful, the thalamus, ev everything goes through the thalamus. That's right. Ascending, descending, the thalamus gives permission. If the thalamus says, nope, not going to do it, doesn't matter. Yeah. So you quiet down the thalamus, you turn on the cerebellum, increase secretions in the cerebellum, but then you have to increase secretions in the sensory and motor cortex so the sensory and motor cortex can find it now that the thalamus is not standing. So if you think of the pathway, there's a cerebellum, the thalamus, and the sensory and motor cortex. Yeah. So if the thalamus is saying, no, you're not going to move it, the sensory and motor cortex never gets to send the signal to the cerebellum that says, hey, sit this way, not that way. That's right. So we first thing you do is quiet down the thalamus. Then I always, I might be wrong, but I turn the cerebellum on first, then because the cerebellum coordinates movement. Yeah. And then the sensory and motor cortex initiates it. Correct. So you go sense thalamus, cerebellum, sensory motor cortex cerebellum again yeah and it it gives us an edge so you can do in 60 minutes what would take a month or two yeah. with just exercise and postural retraining yeah because if the brain is afraid to do it yeah okay no and that's why I love the second day of the sports course is because that's all we do is, you know, and when we had it at, at the facility in Troutdale, we had this, this practitioner, she was an optometrist, but elite judo athlete and right. refs now, but it was so interesting because she had this knee injury, but because of her judo, she was always on her toes and knees over toes and just punched and ready. And I'm like, we need to get your posterior chain firing because you're all anterior. Everything is on your toes. And a lot of athletes love to be in this like sympathetic, the tiger's coming. I got to get ready to run as fast as I can. No, getting you. And so sometimes like with her, it was a simple cue of saying, I want you to put your weight on your heels. And it was like, you could just see it in real time with them. You could see the hamstrings engaged, the glute engaged, the lower back engaged, the lower traps turned on. But we did have to take all those steps that you were just saying, because after 40 years of doing one thing up on your toes, it's not going to just resolve and turn around overnight. So we get to help it. And after 20 minutes, she could, she changed all of her mechanics because that posterior chain was like, oh, this is safe. There's not a tiger coming right now. Cool. And judo and most of the martial arts are all forward. Yes. And it's combat. Yes. So 
the thalamus, the limbic system is part of the training in the sport. Yeah. You have to prepare for combat. For sure. So it's. But just standing and waiting for your Uber, it's not. <laughs> you can be engaged. You exactly. Can Did you spot. see Rick Allen's suggestion? About doing a frozen shoulder thing? That sounds it, cool. So we could do like a two day thing in Troutdale if you'll come up. I would and love that. But wouldn't that be fun? And just do shoulders? Oh, yes, please. Okay. And is Rick Allen the one that does our theme song? Rick Allen? No, that's Rick Coy. Rick Coy. Rick Coy does oh, theme right. is, Yes. But Rick Allen is one of one of the long term. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Lee. Scleroderma. Oh, we're almost at my sleeping, but let's read Debbie's really quick. Okay. So scleroderma oh, was what three or four years ago when Walter pre presented the case report, or I presented Walter's data. Friend visiting this weekend. I'm going to treat trauma before bilateral pneumonia. Her heart raised, so she had to have her heart reset. Ow. A scleroderma, you have to treat. It's an autoimmune condition that affects, that creates inflammation in the capillaries that causes scarring, especially in the fingers and forearms. And in order, it's an autoimmune so you have to turn, do concussion in vagus, turn the vagus on to stop the autoimmune condition, but then you treat scarring in the capillaries, the connective tissue, the joint capsule, the fascia, the nerves, and you run it from neck to hands and you do manual therapy, but you have a second machine running on concussion in vagus for the whole hour. And the data on improving the Colchin hand scores was just extraordinary. Like they went from not being able to pick up a coin to being able to pick them up. It was amazing. Amazing. Rick Allen, great. See you soon. Yes, we're going to get on this. This is so much fun. So much fun. It was so great to be back. And again, we haven't really got through all of my list, but that's okay. I'm patient. Are you I hope everybody like enjoyed my Q and A with we had Dr. Jen Sosnowski on and I made her. Oh, did you? I brought Jen on again and I had her do a functional medicine talk for like more like for patients because I have a lot of patients that listen to our podcast and they were mm -hmm. like it was fantastic but I didn't understand anything. I'm like because it was very much practitioner based. So I had her like do a, like a webinar on functional medicine just for patients like for more. Wow. Yeah, and even that got pretty pretty intense because she's you get in the weeds because the more you know the more you know you don't know yes and the basic challenge with functional medicine is everything is connected to everything yes there's that and the gut is the second brain yes yes the liver and the vagus and the vagus controls the senses and controls the microbiome. So everybody talks about the bacteria in the gut and how important that is. And the bacteria are supposed to produce butyrate. You can take butyrate, but the bacteria, the being able to treat the vagus, being able to repair a leaky gut, and everything's connected to everything. The gut, the immune system, the endocrine system, and the vagus and the brain, it's all here. Yeah. And that's, ma it's magic. I'm so glad you had Jen on. Yeah. I love our circle of people that I can just be like, hey, you got an hour to hang out with me? <laughs> and 40 of my closest friends. <laughs> yes, exactly. And when I had this SBG7 person, right. as soon as I got her, or before I even put her on the table, I texted Ben Catholi. Dave Burke and Roger Bellica and said, what neurotransmitters? Yes, GABA, but what am I missing? And what supplements do I have her take in order to, like if I'm driving secretions in the corticospinal tract, I, we have to give the cells the substrate that they're going to be using to create GABA. What do I give her? 
and I had text messages back from Dave and Ben and Roger texts his cell phone about once a week. So she was gone by the time I got a reply from him. But right. Dave and Ben, it's okay, take this, take that. Only take phosphatidylcholine if she's having trouble with her mouth and stuff that's coming from the ponds. Mm -hmm. it's, yay. Yeah. It's, and then- It's a village. It's a village. village. I like our family. Yes. Okay. okay. That's it for it's today. four o'clock already. It is. Okay. Back to picking cherries. Yeah, lucky you. Yeah. <sighs> all right, everybody. Thanks for coming. We'll see you all. Wait, we're in Denver next week. Anybody hasn't signed up for Denver? We're check. We're Kevin's shipping massage tables and table warmers and chocolate today. Ooh. We'll be in Denver next week, so you'll all be right. on your own again. All right. So there you go. It'll be right. fine. Anybody that has any ideas for me, feel free to email me, Kim at fsmsports365.com. Okay. And we'll put together something fabulous. Of course you will. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.